Good evening to you. Hey, you're already doing this, but uh, some of you that are sitting down, stand up for just a minute. Put a big smile on your face. Find yourself at least three or four hands and shake them. Tell them that you're glad to see them here tonight. Spread the joy of the Lord to somebody tonight. So we read Sunday morning, Psalm 145 said, from one generation to the next, we declare his greatness. And I pray that, that we've not forgotten that. I know, I don't know about you, but I know there's a lot of things that we pour into our brains daily. And a lot of that stuff just pours right back out. But I pray that that would be something that would stick with you dads, it would stick with you grandpas, it would stick with you grandmothers and mothers that you would truly desire to pass on the stories of God's faithfulness to your children. They're meaningful and they're powerful. 
And I love the fact that we get to come together on a Tuesday night. Tuesday night, that's a little unconventional. But you know, I love the fact that even on a Tuesday night, God's people desire to gather and to give testimony to his goodness. And I know you are a part of that, that cloud of witnesses that give glory to the Lord. And so my prayer tonight is we desire to live out that very scripture from one generation to the next as we worship together, that our life would be worship unto the Lord. And we would desire, bigger than this, the songs that we sing, and bigger than the sermons, that our life would go out as worship unto the Lord and tell the stories of his goodness. And so we're just gonna sing together and sing of God's great love for us and the life that he gives us. So let's sing this together. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness. You give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Thank you, Lord. And great are you, Lord. Let's declare this together. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only, Lord. Let's sing that again. You give life. You are love as you are. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. We declare this. And great are you, Lord. We declare this, Father. It's your breath in our love. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. Yeah. 
make this declaration again. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. We sing great are you, Lord. We lift to you, Father. All the earth will shout your praise. Your hearts will cry. These bones will sing great are you, Lord. Just sing great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. From your heart to Him, just in this very moment, may your spirit, may your soul cry out His greatness. Would you do that just between you and the Lord? Just say, Lord, you're so great. You are so great. We thank you, Father, for your love for us. Thank you for your goodness. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to pray, Father, that this worship would be a sweet sound. And Father, we pray that our very lives would be changed. Spirit, have your way. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated tonight. All God's people said? Amen. Amen. What a great night. You know tonight is a great night. I have crossed the Rubicon with your pastor. Yeah, something amazing has happened. He's letting me use this mic tonight. Oh, let me tell you. I pastored for 21 years. Alistair Begg preached in my church. He did not get my mic. Charles Stanley preached in my church and did not get my mic. And pastor has let me use his mic tonight. I'm humbled, man. So, man, I, I just, I tell you, I tell you what, we have some guests uh, tonight that I do want to introduce. Uh, pastor Roy Ford is here from Hooks, Texas. And I don't know how long it took you, pastor, to drive down here. This is one of my favorite people in all the world. And so some of you know that we have a program called Church Shield, 
And, uh, you know, we have three churches in, here in Longview that are in our, our shield, New Beginnings, uh, Woodland Hills, and Macedonia. But the very first church to ever sign up for Church Shield was in Hooks, Texas, Pastor Roy Ford. This man believed in me. And I tell you what, I love you, brother. And he is uh, the field representative for the Southern Baptist of Texas. He's over 17 different counties. So all the way up to Paris, Texas, Cooper, Texas. He's out there all the way to Texarkana. He's all the way to, I don't even know how you cover all that ground. He's going to retire um, December 31st. What if they want you to work January 1st? You going to do it? You're not going to do it. <laughs> but uh, he is, uh, man, he's a, a precious, uh, precious man, and he's got an incredible testimony. And when he's in Dallas, I want him to be on my show. Pastor, uh, Pastor, Pastor Chris and his wife, Nikki, who's sitting up here. Do you have a good day teaching? Yeah? Everything go good? All right. Well, she, they met at Southwestern Seminary, and he, you know, got prayed up and went for it and won the lottery, and uh, he got her. And anyway, next time they come to Dallas, they're going to be on our show. We're going to have them together, and I've got a commitment from Roy that, if he comes to Dallas, he's going to be on our show. But next week, next week, our show has Pastor Bruce Bean on. And if you don't know about our show, it's called Defending the Faith. And uh, it's a top-rated Christian podcast. We're on everything. We're on iTunes, Spotify, Pandora, um, Podbean, all kinds of stuff. We're on Now TV. Uh, we're about to go on American Family Radio as well as uh, Lindell TV. We've got several different things. But Bruce being is going to be on our show, and he is here tonight. He is a, a pastor in Gladewater, Texas. Pastor Bruce, I always forget the name of your church. What's the name of your church? Elevate Worship Center. And I tell you what, the, the show that we did with him is one of the greatest ones that ever happened. His wife was dying of COVID, and they didn't give her much chance, and she was in the hospital in Tyler, Texas. Mother Francis? South of Tyler. I get uh, cities mixed up. What hospital was that? UT. Okay. Yeah, so he was there, and he would actually go, and they would blow kisses to each other out the window because he couldn't get in there. And so, I mean, it's an incredible story where, um, you know, they were told she's going to die, and, and you know, the, he, he prayed and prayed, and the Lord spoke to him and spoke to his heart. She's not going to die. And it's an incredible episode. I mean, it's just uh, amazing, the whole story. And so anyway, so we got so many preachers here, I'm going to get nervous. I'm going to have to give my mic up uh, to, to, to all these guys. But anyway, we had uh, uh, some pastors here last night, and I found out there was another pastor that was here last night that I didn't even know was here that uh, I, I think a lot of. But I'm so glad that you came out tonight in the rain. Thank you. You're awesome. Now, if you have to miss a night, don't miss tomorrow night. And it's the last night. But I'm going to give my testimony of how I turned from atheism to Christ. And, and Pastor Beam, I came to Christ in Gladewater, Texas, just right down from your church in a moving pickup. I prayed the sinner's prayer going down Highway 80, right as I passed the, the, the Gladewater rodeo grounds. I don't know if you've ever been to the rodeo there. That's a world-famous rodeo. That rodeo is huge. You know why? Because one year, Ray Price, the country singer, sang at the Gladewater rodeo. Now, he was from Mount Pleasant, and Ray Price was once asked, who's the greatest singer who ever lived? And, and you know, everybody waited to see if it would be, if he'd say Elvis Presley or, you know, Frank Sinatra or something. Who knows? You know what Ray Price said, who was the greatest singer ever? I saw him sing at the Gladewater rodeo. You know who he said was the greatest singer ever? Ray Price. He said himself. <laughs> hey, man, that's, that's confidence uh, for you. But I was saved. <laughs> right there uh, in front of the Gladewater Rodeo Grounds, and I'm going to tell you the story uh, tomorrow night of how I came from atheism to Christ and the reason that I turned from atheism to Christ. But tonight, I'm going to talk 
about our country. And, you know, at the end of this service, we're going to pray together for our country because I don't know if you know it, but our country's in trouble. I mean, our country is on the decline. I mean, it's, it's bad. You know, there once was a man who declared to the world with these words, God is dead. You know who said that? Anybody know? John Lennon said it, but he was quoting Friedrich Nietzsche. Friedrich Nietzsche, um, he lived in, in the early 1800s, and he was a man who had been influenced by the Enlightenment and the Renaissance, and he thought that man was coming to a place where he knew so much that man would suddenly figure out there was no such thing as God. And when people found that out, he said all the churches would close, the world would go secular, and he said it's going to be bad, bad news because the world will descend into chaos. In fact, he said he was a madman. He called himself the Antichrist because he was the deliverer of bad news because Nietzsche knew something that without God, there's no such thing as love, mercy, justice, nothing like that. In fact, there's a major Christian author who recently wrote a book. Um, his name's Tom Holland, and it's not Spider-Man, by the way. The guy who plays Spider-Man is Tom Holland. Um, but this is a different uh, person. He wrote a book called Dominion, How the Christian Revolution Remade the World. And this is a Christian book. It's currently out. And what's stunning in this book is Tom Holland says these words. He says, when Nietzsche said God is dead, he was right. Now, why in the world would a Christian author say that? Well, what he meant was when he said it, he didn't mean God is actually dead. What he meant was, was that when people get rid of God in their life, they get rid of way more than they think. So in this book, he talks about how Christianity actually remade the world. See, before there was Christianity, the world functioned with societies who were built on shame and honor. You look at these major world civilizations and they, they conquered the world. And the people who were running them, they believed that mercy was for the weak. They didn't believe in love and, and grace or any of these things. They thought those were weak values for pitiful people who weren't strong enough to take what they wanted by force. But when Christianity came along, the world began to get remade, and we began to have these values of where uh, human life is important, values are important, and that justice is important, all these type of things. Now, here's what Nietzsche said. He said what's going to happen, though, is the world is going to get smarter and smarter and smarter until they're going to realize there is no such thing as God. And he, then he said the world is going to collapse into chaos. He said, that's what it means to say God is dead. You know, there is a sense in which Nietzsche was somewhat right. Because when you get rid of God, you get rid of some very important things. For example, if there is no such thing as God, why is murder wrong? I mean, why, really? Why is it wrong? Well, I will tell you why I believe murder is wrong. I believe murder is wrong because God forbids murder. And because God forbids murder, murder is a sin with a capital S. But if you get rid of God, there is no such thing as sin. Do you realize that sin is what it is because God is who he is. So you take God out of the picture. He is righteousness. You can't fathom or understand what wrongness is. See, for something to be really, really wrong, there has to be something that's really, really right. And that rightness is God. 
and he is the one that provides the standard. And you take God out of society, and atheists will try to tell you that everything that's wrong with society is because of religion, Karl Marx, that religion is the opiate of the masses, and it's the problem with the world. It's actually not. It's the only good thing. Um, you know, all of our colleges and universities that were founded here in America, they were founded on Christian values, the same for our hospitals and our orphanages and our relief agencies and nonprofits. All these things were from the Christianity. And you take God out of the world, and the world becomes a very scary place. And I'm going to tell you something. It's a fact that our world and our nation is getting less and less Christian. Even churches. I mean, some of, I, I mean, I, I hate to say this. I mean, we've got preachers in here, but they know what I'm talking about. Some of the younger preachers are scary in their beliefs because they don't believe the Bible. And it's like, if you don't believe the Bible, if you don't believe this Bible's true, cover to cover, what are you preaching? What are you even talking about? Um, and not only that, but, you know, what, who, 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 who made you in a position to be able to say, I stand above God's word and I can tell you that I'm right and it's wrong. What a dangerous place. What a, what a dangerous thing to say. And, you know, we're living in a world in which, you know, some preachers, they're like, hey, I don't want to say anything about sin because I don't want to offend anybody in my church because then they might not come. And then, you know, and then, you know, we have a lot of preachers that are more worried about attendance than they are about proclaiming the truth of God's Word. That's a problem. That's a dangerous situation because then we just become ticklers of people's ears and we just try to tell people what they want to hear instead of what they need to hear. Because you know what? If you really love somebody, you'll try to help them. You know, if somebody comes to a doctor's office and they've got a deadly disease and they're going to die from it, and the doctor says, look, everything's okay, just drink some water. Do you think, is that, is that really good? I mean, is that a good doctor? Is that a caring doctor? Is that a loving? Well, I just didn't want to offend them. I didn't want to get them scared. I didn't want to get them upset or, or worked up. Look, man, people don't need to be coddled or tickled. People need the truth. That's what saves people. You know, because in order to come to God, you can't, you can't come to God unless you first understand you're separated from God. And people are separated from God because of their sin. And until they deal with their sin and turn from their sin and repent to sin, then they can't come to God. But Christianity is weakening. 30 years ago, I heard a preacher say to a, to a big gathering of preachers, he said, the greatest battle for the church in the future is going to be over the family. And I laughed. I giggled to myself. I thought, nah, he doesn't know what he's talking Listen, this is what this whole thing has come down to. Is marriage between a man and a woman, or can it mean a whole bunch of other stuff that's not between a man and a woman? Now, we're... we're to be very clear, the Bible makes it very, very crystal clear that a biblical marriage, which, by the way, I, I, would, I would submit is the only kind of marriage, that if you have another kind of marriage, that you have a civil union, but that's actually not a spiritual marriage. Now, I just had a pastor from Florida, and you pastors here, you know, you're greater than me, but the pastor calls me up, and he says, Frank, he said, we got two older people in our church that want to get married. They're both over, over 75, and they said they want to get married in the church, but they don't, want to, they don't want to turn in the marriage certificate because she'll lose some kind of benefits. And I was like, well, you know, the, the marriage that counts is the one that's in the church. I said, you tell them to give you that marriage thing, and you sign it, and if they don't send it in, then they don't, they don't send it in. But, you know, a marriage is something that's in the eyes of God. The Bible says it's where two become one. Try to do that math. You know, one plus one equals two. Well, no, in the Bible, one plus one equals one. They become one flesh and a union. And the Bible says what God has joined together. That's marriage. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. So I think it's important that you 
get recognized by the state and you send your, you mail your document in, I would urge that couple to do it even if it costs them something because uh, I, I think it's important. But the main thing is, is that you're married in the eyes of God. Um, our country's in trouble. In 2015, we had a Supreme Court decision. It was five to four. It was close. I, I think if they had the same decision today, it would go different. Um, but the name of the court case was the Obergefell decision. And in that decision, the Supreme Court, a group of nine people, suddenly redefines marriage to be something different than what the Bible says, which is a biological man and a biological woman, that it could be a man and a man, or a woman and a woman. And you know what? There's a lot of people who are scared to speak out against that. To say, you know what, that's not right because that's not what God's word says. And so we, and society is quickly breaking down. You know, you think about that. That's eight years ago. Look at how much damage has been done in eight years. I mean, our world is in trouble. The world like 1 John says, is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God will what? Abide forever. So, you know, as the world moves away from God, it's going to let go of three things. It's going to let go of love, freedom, and liberty. Let me ask you a question. Tonight. Are you ready to let go of those things? I'm not, I'm not either. I'm not ready to surrender those things. That's why we need to stand. So, Tonight, if you have a Bible, I want you to turn with me to Galatians 5, 13. And I want everybody to stand as we read God's Word. And I'm just going to preach just one scripture tonight. Galatians 5, 13. Just six words. And I want you to get this in your heart tonight. For you were called to freedom. You may be seated. Now, don't get your hopes up. That doesn't mean the sermon's short. <laughs> Hopefully it is. For you were called to freedom. Now, I could have read more, but I want you to get this in your heart, and I want you to get it in your brain. You were called to freedom. Listen to me. Freedom is a calling. It's a calling on every single person that's ever been born. And let me ask you the question, who calls us to freedom? God does. I mean, the whole concept of freedom goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Do you know what the very first gift that God ever gave man? He gave him the gift of life. He took the dirt, he blew into the dirt, and he created a man in his own image. And he made man male and female. But you know what's interesting about when God first gave man the gift of life? First he created Adam, but then he created the animals. And this is before he creates Eve. Now, you see in the Bible, God creates Adam, and then he creates the animals before he eats, he gets to eat, and he says, Adam, I got a job for you. I want you to name the animals. So they bring the animals in, in front of them. They bring Mr. and Mrs. Giraffe, and Adam says something like, there's a giraffe. Mr. and Mrs. Hippo, he names them. They bring Mr. and Mrs. Otter. I mean, they're bringing all these, and all of a sudden, you know, after several of these, Adam starts to think to himself, now that's strange. There's a Mr. and Mrs. Cat, but not a Mr. and Mrs. Human. And, you know, the Bible says God knew it was not good to be alone. And so God put the man in a deep sleep. You know the story. He took out a rib, and he made the first woman. Now, the Bible when God made Eve, the Bible doesn't tell us what the first words that Adam said, but I know exactly what he said. I challenge you to prove me I'm wrong. I believe Adam said this to Eve. 
you're the only woman in the world for me. I could be wrong, but I think that's, I think that's probably what he said. And so God creates man in his own image, male and female, he made them. And he gives them the gift of life. But the second gift that God gives to man is he gives them the gift of freedom. Now listen to me so carefully. God, God's intention for every single one of us, every human being, is that human beings are free. Do you realize that Eden, was the most liberated environment in history. The Garden of Eden, it was free. It was free from disease. It was free from disasters. They didn't have to worry about earthquakes or tsunamis or hurricanes or anything like that. It was free from death. It was free. And do you remember exactly what God said to Adam? I'm, let, let's, let's look at it exactly. What God said to Adam after he created him and put him in the garden. Genesis 2, 15. Listen carefully. Then the Lord took the man and he put him into the garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. The Lord commanded. I want to emphasize the word commanded. He commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely. Everybody say the word freely. Freely. He commanded him. Freely. So, in the Garden of Eden, the first man who ever set foot on this planet, God says to him, Adam, you are free. And you are free to enjoy your freedom. That's what God created you for. All of us. Don't ever forget this that the source of your freedom is not government, it's God. That's why when you remove God from government, guess what you're fixing to remove? Yeah. And from that moment until now, freedom has been a divine call on every single person's life. The founding fathers, when they decided to risk their lives, and I'm... I would say I'm reading a book right now on George Washington, but I'm listening. It's a 36-hour audio book, and I've been talking a little bit to, to Dr. Chris about it. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because just the risking of their lives. I mean, they all knew they would be hung and quartered if they weren't successful. They either would win this war uh, here in the United States of America for their freedom, or they would all perish. So they decided they were going to go for it. And in this grand experiment where they risk everything for, where you're standing right now, they knew some things. They knew what they wanted and they knew what they didn't want. They knew they didn't want tyranny. They knew they didn't want taxation without representation. And you say, Frank, what was it that they wanted? I'll tell you exactly what they wanted. They wanted freedom. That's what they wanted. That's what it was about. No one said it better than a, than a Christian from Virginia. He was a redhead. We got any redheads in here? Yeah. Well, let me tell you about one of your ancestors. His name was Patrick Henry. He was a redhead. And on March the 23rd, 1775, in St. John's Church in Richmond, Virginia, they met there to deal with tyranny. And this redheaded 39-year-old Christian, he stood up and he said words that would ignite the fires of freedom in this country that have yet to be put out. And what it was it that Patrick Henry said? I bet somebody in here knows. Yes, sir. That's exactly what he said. What did our founding fathers mean by freedom? I mean, what kind of liberty did they want? What kind of concept of freedom did they have? See, here's something that people are trying to erase in our history. When our founding fathers began this country, they understood 
the important connection between God and government. Now, I know people are trying today to say, no, they were about separation of church and state and all this, these type of things. Listen, no. Go back and look. Read the documents. I mean, they were about freedom and faith. They knew they went together. They understood. They understood it was not only necessary for faith, but indispensable for freedom. Because I'm going to tell you something, man. Real freedom this is what the founding thought. You, you could read their own stuff. I'm reading Washington's book right now. He understood this, that he understood that real freedom is given by God. These guys read the Bible. Don't take my word for it. Take theirs. I'll, I'll give you some. Do you remember the Declaration of Independence? You ever heard of that? It says these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Let me tell you right now. Did you know... I don't care what the world tells you. There are such things as self-evident truths. There is such thing as absolute truth. The world's trying to shove subjective truth down our throats. See, because if you can get into make-believe truth where the people in power determine what's truth, then you can magically go abracadabra and turn a man into a woman or abracadabra and turn a woman into a man. But... Scientifically, we know that's not possible. You can't change somebody's chromosomes. You can do surgeries and all kinds of weird cosmetic stuff, but you have not changed someone's biological sex. And I know people are trying to tell us there's multiple, multiple genders, but the Bible tells us, haven't you, Jesus said, haven't you heard? In the beginning, God made them male and female. Now, why am I even having to talk about this tonight? Why am I even having to say it? Because... If you've been out and about in our world, you understand our world is confused. I mean, our world is in trouble. There are such things as self-evident truth. And if you've wondered to yourself, I don't see how a man can be pregnant. I got an emoji on my phone. I didn't ask for it to be put on my iPhone. But any, have any of you noticed that they have a, an emoji for a pregnant man? On the phone? I mean, I thought Apple was supposed to be smart. <laughs> What's happened to Steve Jobs, man? You know, and, and, and you try to ask them. I, I mean, we got a lady on the Supreme Court who doesn't know what a woman is. I mean, we've lost our minds. So do you know how they can actually say a man can be pregnant? A woman who got pregnant who identifies as a man, is now a pregnant man. ta -da! Oh, that's how you do it. Well, I don't know. I'm just kind of skeptical. I'm still thinking to myself, that's a woman. And it never was a man. So the man can't get pregnant. That, to me, is self-evident. You know, the founding fathers said there are self-evident truths, and they said we hold these truths self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You know what the key word is in that document? Bet you hadn't used this sentence in a long time. Unalienable. Nikki, when's the last time you used the word unalienable to your students? Been a while. Yeah. I mean, when's the last time you just decided, I'm going to use that? I, I dare you to use that in a sentence tomorrow somehow. You know, if you go somewhere, and there's some great places to go in Longview. You know, um, the butcher shop. God's in that place. Juicies, yeah. Um, scooters. How many of you been? I took your pastor today to Scooters, and and he got he got saved. <laughs> they have something there called the Carmelicious, and I'm I'm telling you what, man, you go go there. See, he's trying to go right now. <laughs> yeah, he's got one, man. I'm telling you what, that is the business, man. I mean. You got, they're putting a second one in Longview. And uh, 
You know, scholars for years didn't know in the Hebrew what biblical manna was. We do now. It's a scooter. It's right here in Longview. Um, Carmelicious, man. I mean, that will just make you slap somebody. It's, it's, uh, it's so good. But let me tell you what unalienable means. Unalienable. Anybody want to tell me what it means? You're going to learn something tonight. Unalienable means not capable of being taken away. Hmm. So if you have unalienable rights and they can't be taken away, how is that possible? Well, because they were endowed by the Creator. God gave you something that can't be taken away. Now, men can try to support it, but they can't take it away. You know, what I think is unique about what I'm trying to tell you tonight is that this authority for freedom is derived from God. It's bestowed equally on all. Do you know what the true job of, of government is? To protect unalienable rights. Hear that going off? Somebody's, my sermon's so important, they're trying to get this out to people. The job of government originally by the founding fathers was to protect unalienable rights because the founding fathers understood that freedom is a gift from God. Now, there's people in the government that will try to say, you vote for me and I'll, I, will, you know, I will give you this gift. No, it comes from God. And if you want to maintain your freedom, you have to maintain your trust in God. Now, again, I'm telling you what the founding fathers believed. If you don't believe me, take their word for it. You ever heard of a guy named Thomas Jefferson? Next time you're in Washington, D.C., go to the Jefferson Memorial, and you'll see his words right there on it. And he says this, listen to this. The God who gave us life gave us liberty. These liberties are the gift of God. That's third president of the United States. You want to hear what the first president of the United States says, George Washington? He said, let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Whoa. See, without God, there's no such thing as morality. That's what Nietzsche was saying. He was just quoting George Washington. John Adams said, listen to this. There's, there's a lot of people in, in our world who are trying to get rid of our constitution. I mean, there's some people in leadership, I'm just going to tell you flat out, hate our country. They hate where we came from because they, they, they know some things like, so, so John Adams said this, our constitution was made only, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly an inadequate for the government of any other. So you, you take our Constitution and you try to put it with a secular government who doesn't acknowledge God whatsoever, they're not compatible. It doesn't work. Dwight D. Eisenhower said this, without God, there could be no American form of government nor an American way of life. Recognition of the supreme being is the first most basic expression of Americanism. Bottom line, all these great leaders understood this. When God goes, so does your freedom. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about tonight. That's why we have to stand up. That's why every single one of us has to take a stand. You know, if you don't believe what I'm saying, you need to go to a website called freedomhouse.org. And there you will find a list of countries that aren't free. It's a big list. Now, these countries that aren't free are predominantly either atheistic, secular, or Islamic. And they don't have freedom. Why is that? Why is it that those countries don't have freedom? Because I'll tell you why. 
because they don't understand real freedom is given by the one and only one true God. So we need to beware of any leader or any organization that wants to extract God from the public arena. Anybody who wants to separate God from government wants to take your freedom. Mark it down. It's already here. Every time you turn on the news, I mean, the Supreme Court, I mean, it's become a political organization. I mean, it's a systematic eradication of God as they're trying to kill God off. God is not in our schools anymore. Used to, you could say the Pledge of Allegiance in homeroom. You could do all kinds of stuff. I remember I was saved when I was 21 years of age here in East Texas. And I was one of the last people here in East Texas to pray at a Texas high school football game. Any of you remember when they used to pray on the loudspeaker? Anybody remember that? Raise your hand so I can see it if you did. Yeah, that's most of us in here. Now, I prayed one of the last prayers here in East Texas, Dr. Chris, and they took me up to the press box. They'd asked me if I was going to pray. And, you know, a lot of people here in East Texas knew my story. And uh, so I came up and they said, oh, by the way, when you pray, you can't pray in the name of Jesus. You okay with that? Well, I'm not okay with it, but I'll, but I'll do it. That's what you said. I just pray anything I want. I just can't pray in the name of Jesus. They said, that's you can do it. So I got up, and man, I prayed. And then when I came to the end of my prayer, I said, and I'm going to pray in the name that's above every name. The name that if it were said, every knee would bow, every tongue would confess. That was the last time anybody ever prayed in my school. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, I mean, you know, it's just... You know, it's just amazing to me that I couldn't pray that prayer in Jesus' name. Universities have done a really good job of getting God out of their schools. I mean, nowadays they, they're screening people for PhDs and medical degrees and law degrees. I'm not even sure in my law school that you could make it through as a conservative. You just have to give them the answers that you want or you will be weeded out. Um, it's very difficult because... Now we're, we're stifling our scholars that believe in God. You know the greatest, and, and, and stifling God out of science. You know, the greatest discoveries that we've had in this world, the biggest modern breakthroughs were mostly from believers who were involved in science. People like Louis Pasteur and, and, and others. And you look at all these, these great, magnificent things and, uh, you know, like, Somehow we're going to go forward in our knowledge if, if, we, if we don't have God involved anymore. And I think it's just, it's just a shame. You know, they're trying to take God out of society through legislation. And that's why, you know, I'm involved in a lot of court cases. Recently barred by the Supreme Court of the United States, we have several cases, I think, that might go to the Supreme Court that we're doing right now. Um, I mean, 655, I don't want to take too much time, um, but I'll just tell you just real quick about a couple of our cases. We have a couple of pronoun cases right now, and uh, one involves, a, well, you, you would know both of them. Uh, one involves a, a large clothes place, and uh, I'm not going to say the name, but you could dress for less if you uh, shop there. What? Y'all think you know, don't you? I mean, you might. Okay, but, you know, in this particular scenario, someone claims to be a sex that they're not, and they've been written up, and we represent the person. We also represent someone in a major grocery chain. You know what it is, too. And someone's been working there 10 years, and someone that just was hired that's a man now says they're a woman. But in the very same store, there's someone who is a woman who now says she's a man and she says my pronouns are now him and he and the man says his pronouns are she and her and the lady who's worked there 10 years said I'm not going to do it and they wrote her up and that's when we started representing her now 
we have filed for a religious exemption for her. That, by the way, in the workplace, that's the only way you're going to get out of these pronouns is a religious exemption. Because for 10 years, this lady works in this store and lying wasn't a part of her job. So we wrote her religious exemption and we said, look, she's a Bible believer and lying is a sin. She is forbidden to do it. It would be wrong. And it's a really big sin. It's in, one, it's in the Ten Commandments. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Now, is it okay to bear false witness against your neighbor if they tell you it's okay? Is it okay to lie if someone says it's okay to lie about me? Does that make it okay? No, it's not. And so we're living in a society where if you don't start lying about people, you can lose your job. You can get sued, everything else. So that's one of the things we're doing to protect churches. We just, one of our churches, I was telling Pastor Chris, I won't tell you where, but it involves a, a place here in East Texas where the university just got bought by a system that's very woke. And, man, they, they've called us in and we're, yeah, I bet you know. And so uh, the devil came to East Texas, I'm going to tell you right now. So we are having to go in and we're having to change all the church's bylaws. We're having to get things straight for them on their restroom policy, on their pronouns, on their social transitioning policy. I told you all the other day, one of our churches, I was telling uh, Pastor Roy that, that uh, you know, a full-blown drag queen came and sat down on the front row of, of one of our, our major churches and, and the pastor didn't know what to do. I mean, it was such a distraction. And so these are the type of things that are going to ha start happening with more frequency because our public institutions like our schools are saying, you know, you as a parent don't have a right to know what your kids are doing or that if they're trying to change their gender, we don't have to tell you. Okay, Gavin Newsom's about to sign that into law in the state of California. And if you were to object, you could have your kids taken away. So that's where all of a sudden Christian parenting can become illegal in the United States of America. Friends, we're on the precipice of some really bad things because I'm telling you, all this stuff's happening in the world. We get the calls every week and the very next stop is the church. Six fifty nine, and I close. Because if not, I'll just keep going. And if you haven't been here, this church loves it when I close. They just love it. Um, for ten years, I traveled with Dr. Billy Graham, and uh, I went to all of his crusades. We took students from Southwestern Seminary, and they received credit. And I became friends with Dr. Graham. I named. My oldest son after him, his name is Graham. He's named after Billy Graham. And we hope he'll be an evangelist and give people hope and peace and literature. And you can write to me, Billy Graham, Winnipeg, Manitoba, or Minneapolis, Minnesota. No address needed, just put Billy Graham. Anyway, I became good friends with Billy. So I, I, I showed Billy Graham the picture of my son one time, I said, Dr. Graham, I want you to know, this is my son Graham, and I named him after you. Dr. Graham grabbed the picture, looked at the picture, looked at me, he looked at the picture, he looked at me, and, and, and you know, Pastor, Pastor Bruce has played a lot of golf with Graham. We're all big, big golf buddies. So he, Dr. Graham looks at the picture, he looks at me, and finally he goes, they must have a beautiful mother. <laughs> You're right. They do. Y'all saw her. She was here, here Sunday morning. So somebody once came up to Billy Graham, and they said, you know, Dr. Graham, you're wasting your time. You're preaching to all these people, but have you not heard the memo? God is dead. We just want to help you out here. You're just wasting your time. You know what Billy Graham said? God is dead. He goes, he's actually not. I just talked to him. Let's talk to him right now. Would you bow with me for a moment of prayer?
You know, for just a few moments, I want us to take a few moments and pray for our country. You know, there's so many things that need to be changed in our country, but you know, one of the things that may need to be changed is, is us, and we just may need to start crying out to God and, and, and praying for our country. And so we're going to have a, a moment of invitation time, and I'm going to invite some of you just to join me here at the altar just praying for our country. You can pray where you're at, or you can, you can pray up here, and, and uh, if you need to make a spiritual decision tonight, if you'd like to receive Christ, if you'd like to join this church, if you'd like to be baptized, we invite you to come also during this time. But we're going to pray, and and after we've we've sung a little bit and we've 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 all prayed, Pastor, would you would you pray for us and, and close out our service? Let's all stand right now, and we're going to sing and we're going to pray.
Paul writes to the church in Philippians. He says, we are to be as lights that are shining in a world. Certainly in line with what Jesus said, you are lights in a world of absolute darkness. Paul goes on, he says, you are to live as children of God. How do we do that? We live fully aware we are in a crooked, a faultless world in that sense. It is a perverted generation. Wow. Among whom you shine like stars. I'm telling you, church, we must believe that the gates of hell will not prevail. I heard one pastor say long ago, and I pray I'd never forget it, the darkness of a thousand nights cannot suppress the power of one single light. You stand as you stand firm in Christ. You stay anchored to the authority of the Word of God. I'm telling you whether the youngest of children, as they mature, believing, taking God at His Word, to take a stand for Christ. Whether it's school, standing in line, waiting for the bus, waiting for the school lunch, whatever that looks like. As they learn what it means to be a devoted follower of Christ, living in a faultless, crooked generation that says there is no God. I said, oh, yes, I love the way it was said. I know he's real and I know he's alive because I talked with him this morning. Take that away from us, church. Paul goes on, he concludes with this. He said, live, live in the light of that love. Walk in a manner worthy of the high calling that you and I have been saved for. It is your charge, it is my charge. We are recognized as being devoted followers of Christ, disciples of the Lord. Let's shine for him. Let's live for him. We come to retreat in houses like this. We are sent out to shine. Let's shine, y'all. I mean, let's be unashamed and talk about Jesus. Celebrate him. I'm telling y'all, I had this opportunity today at lunch with a bunch of other preachers. We did our best to get thrown out of the outback today. <laughs> just talking about Jesus, laughing about, telling stories of just the goodness of the Lord. So much so that I had a quick just conversation with the waiter about his relationship to Christ. He said, man, I've heard of Macedonia. And he asked me, hey, do you know so-and-so? Yeah, I know them. He said, man, he used to be my youth pastor. He said, I wonder where he is. He said, man, I don't know. He said, but let me ask you, do you have a church connection? He said, man, not right now. I said, man, don't stay there. Get connected. Don't lose where you know where you've been with God before. He loves you. I want you to be a part of this church. Jump back in. He said, man, I will. Praise God. Amen. Let's pray together. God, love you so much, Lord. Hey, everybody. It's Pastor Chris. Just want to say thanks for watching today. I hope you were encouraged in your relationship with Christ from everything that was taught and said in the service. Listen, as a church family, we're praying for you and honored to have you as a part of our church family. Whether you're with us here on campus or online as a participant through our web ministry. So go to MacBC, stay connected for updated information. And as well, you can always reach out to us, whether a phone call or an email, and let us know how we can be in prayer for you or how we can send you information and resources to help you grow in your relationship with Christ. All right, we love you, the Lord. And we look forward to seeing you soon. God bless you.